I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, where to begin your dev-centric cloud infosec journey. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today, Guy Eisencott, Product Management, and Ashley Ward, Technical Director, both with Palo Alto Networks. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee. There is a chat box at the top right of your screen. Feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. With that, I'll hand it over to Guy and Ashley to kick off today's presentation. Thanks very much, Libby. So yes, well, here we are. Thanks to CNCF, we have this presentation. Now, what it's entitled, where to begin your dev-centric cloud infosec journey. But when is infosec ever meant to have been dev-centric? Isn't this just pandering to developers who should have been making their work security centric from the beginning? I'm Ashley Ward. I'm technical director of the office, the CTO. And with me, though, is Guy Eisencock. Guy is actually a senior director of product management. He's the one who knows what he's talking about. Uh, instead, I'm just the aggressive, angry one in this conversation. So, Guy. Here we have a cutout from the CNCF landscape of security companies. There are oodles of them. We've got security everywhere. Any different little bit you might want, there's a security company. So what's the problem? No problem. Here are all the solutions, right? <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be aggressive, and I might be passive aggressive. You're too but, nice. Uh, Stop that. I'm trying to poke you. Yeah. Good luck. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I think what uh, what I think is very interesting about the landscape um, is that it really demonstrates the fact that we have developers on both sides of the aisle. We have security developers that are working tirelessly to try to inject uh, their long uh, thought processes and how to uh, ev eventually implement um security controls on a on a, on a very uh rapid deploying rapid uh, rapidly growing ecosystem and on the other hand you have a uh, growing populations of uh, developers and application developers web developers infrastructure developers that have hands-on access um to the core uh infrastructure that's going to run applications for the some of the biggest companies in the world uh, so what happens when you have talented developers on both sides of the spectrum is, uh, is, is this fantastic uh, landscape where companies and individuals even and, uh, in the, and individual communities identify um, um, very granular pro problem spaces and tackle them head on. Uh, as a developer, sometimes you don't have the privilege to whine. Uh, you have the privilege to try to solve things um, as they are. Uh, maybe I'm being too optimistic here, but what, uh, what, what are your thoughts on on how wide this landscape is. No, I mean, I, I, I completely get what you're saying, but it's, at some point, I mean, what, what are the challenges? I mean, isn't isn't this, like you said, I mean, I, I saying about security people whining, isn't this, what, what, what's the problem here? We've got all these tools coming out. What's Why, why is it such a big deal? Uh, yeah, good good question. I don't want to boil this down into, into something that's being too, too simplistic, but uh, I, I think really that the title of this uh, this talk is going to be not only uh, what should you do, but where do you start? I think a lot of um, a lot of people maybe that that are attending this talk, and and I've definitely been on this trail starting uh, starting our startup about two and a half years ago. Is what is going to be best of breed, and what's going to be good enough when you when you want to build an enterprise grade web application that's hosted on the public cloud. And one of the complicated things as a developer coming into this space is that there's so much to choose from and there's going to be so little uh, that you can trust an external vendor or a third party uh, service provider to give you uh, compared to things that you can either mix and choose and, and build your own best of breed. 
So if I'm speaking to my, myself two and a half years ago as a technology leader and a product leader, um, I think the biggest challenge has been where do I actually start if I want to build really secure cloud infrastructure? See, now that is, that is interesting because actually one of the things I was then going to hit you with was that, well, actually the research has been done to show that we're, we're not getting there. Um, I know our, our Palo Alto Networks have a Unit 42 research um, department, but there's also uh, the bridge crew research as well, of course, which is just as valid. Um, and, and we come up with these numbers. Now, I, I always worry when we display numbers like these that we're trying to fear monger. And so I, I immediately go, we're not trying to fear monger. We're trying to say that the, the, the issue exists. But uh, so these seem like really simple things, Guy. I mean, what? what I, I get that we're still not doing them, but you know, I speak to CISOs regularly, and a, a CISO would look at this and say, well, why isn't this happening? Shouldn't people just know to make sure that cloud databases should be encrypted? I mean, what? why is this such a big deal? Yeah, and, and I think you're you're, you're going to, to take the side of, uh, of the security practitioner in this conversation. I'll try to take the position of a, of a developer, or again, a technology or an architecture leader, um, I think what research that we've done internally in Bridgeview and now we've we've seen done uh, on Unit 42 and others um, is is just take a look at these uh, consistent numbers where where if we lay, we look at configurations we look at vulnerable images we look at misconfigurations on 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 our centralized um, artifact our public artifacts for 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 Helm charts you can see these ecosystems are consistently misconfigured but not because of human error. Uh, for the other re exact reason, we're trying to make it that simple for developers to ramp up from zero to a working, a functioning uh, cloud environment using boilerplate templates. So whether that's a boilerplate template you capture from GitHub, whether that's a boilerplate chart you get from Artifact Hub, you're bound to get a uh, configuration which will only bring you thus far into a running, a working hello world. And what happens is that those boilerplates um, are sometimes not treated as such. And this is across um, multiple ecosystems in our, in our landscape. Um, they are getting consistently misconfigured. What do you, have you seen any specific ecosystems that you think are more prone to error than others from a security standpoint? Oh, the thing, I think you've, you've, you've kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit around that whole Sometimes from a security point of view, people, and it's human nature, right, to, to, to try and just abstract things away or to pigeonhole things. And, and, and one of the things is about around, you know, a developer and a security person. And, and we all have these nice, it's easier to have these slots for things. But in fact, that's not, that's not how things work. We're, it's such a huge field and such a huge subject that you're not going to be an expert in all of these different areas. And, and and, and really, you shouldn't be. I mean, it, somebody who's building a platform is going to have different priorities to someone who's, you know, building an application. Even though both of them, if they're developing code, are are developers at the end of the day. You know, so no, I, I find that really interesting. So we we have again more more research driven uh, information because that's you know that's how we how we want to do things. We've got this whole notion of, we've seen Terraform templates, we've seen Kubernetes manifests in different ways. I certainly can hold my hand up to a few of those on the Kubernetes side of things, but from the Terraform template side, Guy, talk us through some of these things. Yeah, uh, we'll get to some practical examples later on, but t uh, just take a look at networking as an example. So if you remember, you know, if you, if you, if you had an on-prem um, data center, uh, just what, two, three, four years ago, uh, we had, networking engineers that their sole purpose um, um, for us as business owners was uh, to go out and capture best of breed infrastructure um, and essentially hardwire configure it in a way that really makes sh makes sure that what needs to be inside stays inside and what needs to be outside stays outside and what cloud native has done um, specifically for the role of the networking engineer it's essentially democratized it, democratized it. A microservice can essentially become a, a, a networking edge in a flip of a button. And what we saw from our Terraform studies is that it's it's not just, you know, take, if you think of something like a security group concept, which is um, the AWS equivalent of a firewall rule, that's not enough to get you protected if you want a specific workload to be 
um, private and not pu public. You have to be cautious of everything else that's going to wrap around your compute instance, whether that's the security group internally, and then you're going to have your VPCs, the way that your accounts are set up, peering. There's a bunch of different ways to make connectivity work in a public cloud, and that's just AWS and Terraform as a surface. What happens is, uh, what, what happens now when you have those microservices set up as individual networking nodes uh, that suddenly have their own networking capacity and networking interfaces, and that's where we move right to the Kubernetes side, right? And that's that that's a that's an entirely different world where networking is is completely extracted through um, through networking interfaces, and there's tons of great projects that are now trying to help us go through the barrier of the deprecation of things like network pod policies and start to go to a more uh, a more standardized future with uh, with with some some great insights into into how you can consistently um, uh, invoke networking on on a variety of different uh, uh, edges on on your uh, networking cloud um, but networking is not alone right you mentioned databases um, that's that's another one so um, I think we're past the point where we have uh, the notion that we need to maybe encrypt um, or uh, or just uh, use uh, use standalone uh, um, uh, networking uh, excuse me databases that uh, retain data in a way that uh, that is consistent with with how we want to preserve uh, private information as an example um, but databases are also uh, becoming this entire world where it's not just the DBA that controls the configuration of the database you have you know networking for that database right you have logging for that database backup and recovery for that database all of those parameters now become <clears throat> knobs and switches that can developers can turn on or, or off and and potentially harm the the, the overall posture of uh, of how data is handled you, you, you know, you're, you're so right. And the sad thing is, is that that's these were all things that were abstracted away, or roles, or shoulders of giants that were, that were you know, people did before. I, I smiled there as you were talking because I have a very close friend who's a, who's a DBA, and and you know, our relationship from the very beginning was always he would come to me probably to ask me for more file system storage. Uh, because his database would just consume everything that was there. But, but you know, he would then have a similar relationship with all the different applications that would run on that shared database. And people would forget that actually there was a, a whole lot of effort that I put into for the operating system. He put into from the, the, the database, the relational database at the time, a very famous one that everyone knows and loves, uh, a relational database, all the settings there. And then the different schemas had different people who would, who would look after schemas. But you've got all of this thought and intellect that goes into it. And you mentioned backups and, and all that. I, I mean, it's, it's a huge thing that was done previously. I'm not saying we go back to these glory days of multiple layers. What I'm saying is that a lot of the time there were many decisions made that were were perfectly in keeping with stuff. I mean, in Kubernetes manifest land, runs as root or privileged containers. A, I watched a really interesting talk on KubeCon, which was about, here's what happens when you run a container as root. Now, as somebody who, who had root access and very proudly, uh, you know, had the got root t-shirt, that was me, I, I had root, I was the man in charge. Um, as somebody who did that, to me, having root was it was clear, it was super user access. But actually, it was really interesting seeing, well, if you grant root privileges to a container and then have a container be able to make use of those, then actually bad things could happen. And, and the whole audience loved this talk. And, and while I'm going, am I a dinosaur? This is if you grant something root. But it, it's because it's not clear, because that wasn't the life that people lived of having to manage root access and who can do what and what happens. But the, the other thing is, you, you were very kind and said that you know it's not people who necessarily do this. For the Kubernetes manifest, I'll hold my hand up and say that I've probably done those top three quite happily at many times in order to try and get things working. Certainly, I know I'm all sharing the host networks, one thing. For number three, sharing a host file system, I think I've I've certainly um, uh, I've been bad at doing that type of thing, uh, certainly myself. So listen, what then is the answer with all of this? What can we do to try and make things better? I mean, we, we've talked around the problem, and now you know you come along this way, but I, I don't think it's just a tooling thing. Come on, what, what is it that we should be talking about? I'll give you my my point, my, my perspective on this, and and I think you have your your individual and and, and thoughtful one as well. But I, I like to look at um, if we started back on the landscape. Now let's focus on the individual team, and um, and and we have this abstraction of a development lifecycle, which which is purposefully 
uh, abstracts away some of the complexities of, of CICD pipelines because we're we want to start to think about um, development life cycles as a spectrum. We have on our far left the development stage. We, we're going to break that down in a little bit, but if you think about how code gets composed, gets um, um, collaborated between teams, gets reviewed, that's a, an entirely um, a new, uh, newly found pros process that teams that are being thoughtful about how they want to make sure that their uh, their good code arrives downstream and not the bad code are putting more and more emphasis on how do we create developer guardrails that are not restricting um, us from building but are actually helping us to prevent uh, the miserable mistakes that we can do downstream. And then on the far right, and we'll get to the middle in a sec, we have a runtime. And, and, and from my perspective, it's usually from a security standpoint, it's really uh, where it's probably too late, right? Because if we had, you know, our, our best and brightest um, building our business logic, uh, reviewing it, analyzing it, deciding that it's production ready, testing it naturally, um, by the moment it gets into, into runtime and we have the most sophisticated tools out there that are trying to capture the misconfigurations and to make sure no one gets in, um, usually the effort to uh, roll those uh, back and make sure that a, a, a misconfiguration is no longer in runtime is something that could cost us a lot. It could, can cost us a lot in, in our SLAs and SLOs, and it can cost us a lot in, in human effort to make a, uh, a business logic that had worked previously uh, work now with, with injected insights from runtime. And this is where that middle part comes into the picture, and that's where I think the biggest promise is over time, is seeing teams that are making the effort to take that initial portion of code review and making sure that that code gets reviewed in variety of stages with proper context that mimics the best way that a runtime environment will behave. Uh, whether that's in a CICD process, uh, a lower grade production, a pre-prod, if you will, those are the types of processes that have become, become common knowledge, but making sure that they get security verified and, and identified for potential issues using some of the tooling that we've seen previously is where I think the next big uh, leap in terms of security maturity we're going to see amongst uh, cloud native teams. That's, that's really interesting because usually from a security point of view, it's all about, and I, again, I've got friends who laugh at me, as soon as we say shift left, it's like I get paid every time I say shift left. And so it, it does feel sometimes to go shift left, as far left, in fact, make up more left and, and put it even further left than we can. But actually, you, you, you've you called out that certainly that develop phase is, is really important, but you, you've got a whole lot of value and distribute and deploy. That's that's really exciting. Now, for, for everybody who's on this call, this is taken, that's the CNCF security SIG, the, the special interest group, that's the white paper we've, we've pulled those out from. Um, and I will call out um, a, a friend of mine, a colleague actually, but a friend as well, uh, Vinay uh, was a co-author on that. So really exciting for that part. But let, listen, sorry, Guy, I've, I've gone on sidetracked again, but go and dive into a little bit more around this one. Yeah, so if we, we now double click maybe one layer deeper into, into uh, that previous slide and give you a, a little bit about how we at Bridgefoot kind of tackled it when we try to identify the human and technical interfaces where it really becomes very valuable um, to start getting deep contextual insights around how infrastructure gets rolled from the point it, it was fetched from a um, a module uh, that was publicly available, like the Terraform registry or the Artifact Hub, to the point where it gets deployed in a production environment. And, and we went really, really deep, and we, we really wanted to start with the individual developer's IDE, because it, it's, you know, it's amazing sometimes we forget about how much control and how much access we give the individual developer when it comes to cloud native apps. You mentioned uh, root access before in Kubernetes. Um, if you think about a developer that's building a net new application from scratch, they're going to essentially, when con when configuring the code that eventually runs the manifest for 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 that uh, for that Kubernetes um, uh, cluster workloads, um, you understand that a lot of the decisions are going to be made probably weeks or months before um, before that uh, that gets eventually into prod. So that root access that appeared in runtime on the end of the process actually appears all the time on the individual developer's IDE. And when you go into that type of mindset and you identify there is a lot of complexity 
uh, that goes into building out secure by default infrastructure, you identify the, ID, the individual de developer's ID as an opportunity. Now I'm, now I'm going to speak from a security mindset um, and, and say we can give developers best practices on how to set up their local environments, and we can give them even further guidelines and details on what types of linters, testers, uh, verification tools they're using um, on their individual workstations. And this is where I think organizations are going to have to go beyond just uh, requesting or requiring people to, to use these tools on ID. Um, but this becoming a uh, de facto standard. That's interesting because that's certainly that's that whole um, pyramid of testing and, and the type of stuff that you can do frequently and often and you can do that in your IDE. Um, and, and it ties in again with that whole thing you mentioned before, which is, you know, when we look at a developer, there could be a developer who's doing infrastructure as code and, and somebody else who's writing a, a, a different an application or doing something there because that was something I found in very early days writing um, well, Puppet or Chef or whatever at the time, and about going, okay, well, why don't I have some linting take place? Just as you mentioned, that's that's really exciting. I like that guy. Yeah, me too. Um, let's maybe take this real quick and, and kind of merge between uh, pre-commit and pull, pull and merge request processes. Um, and this starts with a, we had an earlier conversation about GitOps, you and me, and we, we talked about the opportunity that uh, Git as a platform, regardless to what Git platform you're using, is introducing to uh, automated security testing. And, and one thing that we really like is the fact that we can invoke a conversation that's triggered by automation and that brings together developers to make a decision as part of coding. And when you think of the request process, you know, we're used to building Naturally, the the you know the the front the front end servers on one end, the back end servers from the other end. We all meet together at the pull request, kind of do our end to end testing, making sure all of that works. That's a conversation teams are very much accustomed to. One interesting um, uh, recommendation and and uh, a pattern that we're we're seeing some of the more advanced infrastructure and platform team taking on is using automation to invoke that conversation by identifying issues together um, uh, in front of a group as part of the PR process. So if I am an individual developer and this automation, testing automation that I've done uh, introduced a misconfiguration detection as part of my PR process, this now invites, especially in our asynchronic world, a conversation about how do we want to um, address a specific type um, of configuration as a, as, as a life cycle in our application. Um, so that's something really, really interesting that we see teams already implementing. And, and naturally, that that take kind of takes on and progresses into CICD. And if you have centralized CICD and you have multiple developers that are kind of, uh, you know, looking at those CICD logs, testing out and to see variety of ways to automate and use a variety of different ways to uh, build out uh, pipelines to uh, to secure different types of workloads. That where that's where a conversation can be done based on metrics and stats because in CICD you can you can Docker build so you can identify the vulnerabilities and you can mimic a, a pre prod using um, using a dynamic analysis or or other uh, types of capabilities that are only available at that stage. So um, these might seem as two different conversations, but they have one thing in common where we're bringing in more context in front of more people for them to have the decision uh, made communally um, and not an afterthought once the infrastructure is already deployed, right? Yeah, that's a, that, that ties in. That doesn't matter then. I mean, you, you mentioned there's various different, various different uh, source code providers, various different even Git methodologies as to what kind of workflow you're using there. But either way, that ties in, doesn't it? I mean, that means all of a sudden you're actually having that conversation. You're opening up and you've got that information to say to make an informed choice. I mean, even if that informed choice is no, we need to carry on with this. That's great, but at least it's not happening in this diagram at that very last runtime run time phase where you would then be throwing up blockers or doing anything that's like that. So that's that's really good. I mean, so the, the, we've got here um, that that SegWhite paper. It's really really good. We've taken those those graphics from it and presented in a single in a single place. It does look pretty busy here. I mean, if I'm if I'm coming to this as that angry security guy, as I'm as as I started out this conversation, as I mean, th th this is difficult, right? There's there's an awful lot to this. What what type of way? I mean, where do we get started with this? 
yeah, like like everything, I don't want to oversimplify, especially with uh, with, with uh, some of the great work that's already being done um, in CNCF with regards to security. But we do have a couple of best practices that uh, that we want to kind of lean towards when we uh, when we look forward into 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 implementing uh, development by secure development by default. Um, I think it goes back to <clears throat> uh, ownership, and one of the things that uh, that's interesting for me to observe is to see the fact that um, teams that initially had DevOps functions, I think I'm not aware of a company that uh, is cloud native and doesn't have a DevOps function, is now starting to break away into more granular sets of, uh, of ownership with regards to platform and infrastructure, and making sure that the secure configurations is something that developers um, consume from a secure uh, uh, location the same way as they would uh, consume binaries. And uh, and use that to build um, safe uh, and secure uh, platforms, right? And, um, and and I think that's a trend that we'll see going forward. And as as far as I can tell, uh, we can see infrastructure team more um, on the bottom part of your screen, focused on creating the development and the right runtime infrastructure for people to be able to ship the code as as securely as possible using infrastructure that's pre vetted. And then platform teams are developing the um those uh paved paths or paved roads um for infrastructure for excuse me for uh the, for for web developers and 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 other um um uh, server side developers to be able to consume uh, uh small rationalized bite-sized pieces of platform for them to um naturally innovate guy yeah, that's that's really good and actually something you didn't know because it's not something we've ever spoken about that ownership piece to me is a, is a huge thing. I actually I actually think that's a, a major thing. This mis, misunderstanding about what ownership means and the continual development, nurturing and loving of whatever it is that you have ownership for. I, I think there's a huge bit there. So it was really actually really good to hear you you talk about that part. Now, where you know we're here, there are people listening to us. They don't want to just hear about why I think what you've said is amazing. <laughs> where do people get started? Yeah, uh, so we wanted the takeaway part to come as early as as possible in this talk. So we it took us thirty minutes, uh, <laughs> but but we're here now. I think you know these are universally uh, biased towards uh, my and, uh, and Ashley's uh, uh, personal experiences. But if we look for a place to start, um, these are these are some of the guidelines that we've practiced internally in our teams and are now advocating in our current roles. Um, let's start from the left. Let's shift to left and, and start with collaboration, which I think is is rudimentary, goes without saying, but there needs to be a way to have meaningful technical discussions that happens between developers and security. And, and cloud is the one that pushes us to have those discussions without overhead for management or architects, uh, God forbid, and really have that as a straight dialogue. I've mentioned the ownership model. Um, and I think the the SIG paper from CNCF breaks out the, the initial path for that. Um, second actionable piece of advice, we'll get to this in a quick demo in a sec, is start with visibility. Start with identifying um, you know the the types of configuration frameworks, the types of infrastructure that your teams are using. Um, and if you're not aware of them, there's great uh, great tooling out there to get you started to get create that initial inventory uh, of what people are using. I've found that the best way to actually find out is just talk to the people themselves. Run a quick Google spreadsheet. Make sure that you have a, a tally of uh, if people are using um, uh, clouds or, or configuration frameworks that you're not familiar with. And if you, you're still in need, um, use technical means of identification and discovery. Those will get you a long way. Next part of that is guardrails. So once you identify what you want, uh, what you want to start monitoring is developer guardrails, whether those are in ID and or all the way down to runtime. And we're big proponents of embedding those insights and tooling as, as, as early as possible in the pipelines. I've talked about IDEs, um, pull requests, feature request scanning is fine. CICD, uh, probably more prominent now. Get, get that visibility as, as far left as you can. That will probably bring a long ways to uh, bringing the uh, detection of the solution and the identification of the, uh, of the problem into, into, the rights of the right, into the hands of the right people. Um, and last, I think what the landscape offers us is the option to choose between building your, you know, building from scratch, um, uh, leaning on the shoulders of giants and using open source that uh, this community has cultivated in the last five years, 
Um, and last, don't hesitate to use commercial tooling. Um, you can select the best of breed to put, you know, the um, the benchmark on where you want to go, and then you know close the gap based on your um, your personal preferences and and how much of a capacity you're you're willing to intake in terms of uh, risk appetite. But so I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm wearing the t-shirt, so that's where I come from. But I, I look at it as so I was a customer before I before I came over and, and worked with Palos and Edwards, and not going into anything on the the product side, but I, my differentiating the value that I added running an open shift platform or bringing the financial services organization into cloud wasn't the security aspect it was an essential part of what we did but it but it wasn't it wasn't what added value my end customers didn't care how that i'd written the most amazing or engineered the best solution it was it was about it was about doing the right thing so listen we don't need to go in obviously we're not we're not going having the product we're not trying to do that but can you actually show us something around this i mean what does that actually look like and I'll stop sharing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll start sharing. Um, so if you're not familiar, I'm personally invested in an open source called uh, Checo. Uh, Ashley, do you see my screen now? I do. I can see your console window there. Beautiful. So let me uh, spell it out for you. So Checo is an open source utility, one of four uh, that I've associated with hands-on for the past uh, two years. And Chekhov is a policy as code frame framework uh, that we've been working on um, since around 2019. Uh, it was started out by one of my co-founders, uh, Barack Shoster, who has been building and developing open source software since he was probably 14. And he helped me identify about two years ago the fact that one of the initial key components to identifying misconfigurations um, and being able to resolve them in the correct location is to be able to have a portable and a lightweight utility that provides that visibility wherever uh, you want to use it. And that is, I think, probably uh, the most important uh, uh, point for, for people that are getting started. Start with something that's portable and lightweight that can teach you where you want to get started. Um, so Chekhov, I mentioned policy as code. What, what does it do? It scans uh, using a, um, a technique of uh, both study code analysis and also a graph-based dynamic analysis, manifests of configurations in cloud-native applications. So we've mentioned Terraform, uh, CloudFormation, Azure's resource manager templates, ARM templates. Um, from the cloud-native side, it also does uh, CDK if, you, if you're in, in, into that as well, uh, serverless. Um, um, as well, but it also goes into uh, Kubernetes and Helm as well. So it really provides a nice broad coverage of some of the most popular configuration methods out there. And the nice thing about Chekhov, and, and if you've used, you know, naturally Kubernetes or Terraform in the past and Docker, um, it follows that design pattern of you can run it locally on your workstation. It's actually a Python based tool. So you install it in a simple, in a, in a simple uh, pip command. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can run it locally and start to kick the tires based on your own um, own code. And I have maybe, let's see, one, one scan. So check off, I've already installed it. I've, I'm pointing it into a directory that I have locally that's storing some of my GCP manifests and, uh, and I'm running the scan. So what check off will do once I run the scan, it will um, look into a variety of uh, files that we have. Um, in this case, defining Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud uh, um, uh, uh, configurations based in Terraform. And it will um, run them through about, I think it's almost 900 or 1,000 policies across all of those seven or eight frameworks that I've mentioned previously. And what it will do, it will start to flag um, varieties of configurations and identify if those individual files are configured correctly or incorrectly. So very, very straightforward. Um, I run this locally. These are files I have local on my uh, on my Mac. Uh, past uh, past instances look like this. And then here's a failed instance. Not to get too much into the weeds of it, but essentially what, it, what we did here is we analyzed a uh, resource block that defined, in this case, a SQL database in Google Cloud. And we started to resolve all of the different attributes in that file. Um, so we looked at the database version, the, reg the region, and the individual settings. And you can see all of these are, are set up in, in Terraform code. 
against most of these, we have verification tests, most of them aimed around security and compliance, uh, but some of them are around also uh, reliability and cost. And the nice thing about them is we've actually written less than 30%. Most of the checks in, in Chekhov today are actually community, community um, uh, sourced. We've had people from some of the biggest companies in the world run Chekhov over the past two years and find, you know, the craziest and, and anomalous types of findings you can find. And by their journey into creating safe infrastructure, uh, Chekhov was uh, was uh, their weapon of choice to be able to, to start to identify some of these issues. Um, the nice thing about it, I mentioned it, I run it locally, I can test it. No one needs to know that I was um, out of bounds by uh, defining a, um, a bad uh, bad certificate um, on, on, on a database or I wasn't using the right configuration uh, uh, properties. <clears throat> Ashley, any questions? You've seen this, right? Uh, no, well, I have seen that one part because I did do that install. I downloaded and installed Chekhov myself and ran it against one of my Terraform uh, templates. And like you said, the nice thing was it well, actually having the block to say, hey, this is what it is. And then exactly as you've done, it was that thing of going, well, nobody needs to know what mistakes I've made locally. I can then find out and learn more about it myself. It's very nice. Exactly. So we, we didn't open source and, and community source only the policies, but we also decided that we want to fully open source and, and publicize the documentation that went behind the scenes. So we had our, you know, our over 100 maintainers, probably more than 1,000 um, uh, core users that were constantly providing us valuable feedback into how to properly identify and, and fix issues uh, based on what they've been seeing in the field. Um, so we collected that information and we logged it. And, and we've collected, a, a, I think, one of the most comprehensive um, sets of inform set, data sets of uh, how to identify and resolve issues in, um, in, in, uh, in, in all three uh, cloud providers. Um, so this is a completely open uh, resource you can utilize. And the nice thing about this is when, once you get this naturally deployed into uh, something like a GitHub action and this becomes crowdsourced, um, developers have a single point to click to identify not only the problem, but also uh, the fix. <clears throat> um, so we, we wanted we wanted Chekhov to be something that uh, everybody can use and everybody can have visibility to. Uh, so it's really built in that uh, really consistent design pattern where you can, I'm going to Chekhov minus help to show you some of the variety of options you have um, to, to be able to deploy this, but you can essentially run this on a variety of uh, SCMs. You can run it as a GitHub action, as a, as a, a pipeline task in Bitbucket, uh, natively in your uh, in your GitLab runner and in probably any type of uh, CI tool you can imagine. So really easily um, uh, exportable into all of those uh, popular CI platforms, encapsulated into a single Docker uh, can be run essentially anywhere and provide tons of value as part of a CI CD run, um, especially for a smaller team that's looking to to get um, get that insight before issues are deployed into production. Uh, you can see we have the varieties of um, of be able to run a, run a full quiet uh, uh, session with the ability to uh, skip individual checks or to run just specific checks. Uh, we've recently introduced the ability to do uh, image scanning natively and variety of ways to kind of fix and 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 instantly mix and match based on your uh, individual preferences. Uh, the the overwhelmingly uh, popular uh, usage pattern would usually be someone uh, who's probably listening in to, on this webinar. Pip installs Chekhov, identifies that it gives them value locally, and then uses some of these advanced options um, to identify the best ways to uh, to use it in their uh, CI/CD pipelines. So that, and, and that's the thing. So you by by having that help the, the help format there to show us. I mean, it, it, even even me as a luddite, I can see exactly how I could make use of that as calling a webhook to call Chekhov to have that result. And even if then we agree to we're going to we're going to um, that whatever the failure was, actually, it's acceptable because for whatever reason, I've decided my business risk is such that this is OK, then then it's easy to then we either skip that check or, or continue with that check or, or however you want to do it. But the important part is that visibility and everything is is absolutely there. That is yeah. that really cool. Yeah, one thing, I, uh, last one thing I want to show you, I know we, we're, we're kind of running out of time. Uh, we've done one last thing, which is to mount Chekhov on 
um, a very popular um, code editor, uh, Visual Studio Code. You might be familiar with. It's also uh, part of uh, part of uh, a, a very uh, recent uh, launch coming out of GitHub uh, around code spaces. If you're familiar with, um, but if you're a v VS Code user, <clears throat> one of the ways to infiltrate and to get into into ID and to make sure some of those valuable insights <clears throat> arrive into the desktops of developers any everywhere is uh, through this uh, through this extension that's that's also fully open source and accessible to our community. Um, and what this essentially does, it it mounts on top of a VS on a VS Code that's running and, and analyzing already analyzing your hard written uh, infrastructure as code, and it kind of annotates the problems as uh, as you compose as you run the code. So in this case, I have um, a couple of my managed Kubernetes uh, files here on hand. You can see I have um, an Azure Kubernetes uh, file and in, in, um, in, an Amazon one and a GKE and a Google one as well. And once I have the extension wired here on the back end, you see that I have Chekhov scanning here <clears throat> on, the, on my bottom pane. And what Chekhov will essentially do for you as a developer, even if you have you know, zero tolerance to security people um, uh, reviewing your code and telling you what you need to be um, doing, it's going to inject those insights and those all, all, over th almost a thousand policies there um, native coding experience. It will do so by annotating the individual resources, um, listing out the variety of problems that may have been found in a much more pleasant way inside uh, those code manifests. And it will even go as far as giving you the ability to single click fix or generate a skip comment um, for select instances of configuration. Uh, so you can use the drop down, point at your resource of choosing, and then with a single click of a fix, add a missing attribute, for example, to enable logging, to disable the cube dashboard, and just to uh, make sure that uh, uh, your settings are aligned correctly. If you're interested on where these misconfigured files came from, they actually came from another open source project by Bridge Crew, which is uh, Terragoat, which will give you uh, the opportunity to kind of use a, a vulnerable by design set of files to train um, and educate yourself about how misconfigured code might look like and use something like the Chekhov plugin to be able to uh, to analyze and to identify the best ways to fix uh, or resolve uh, the variety of issues that can be found in in a popular manifest like uh, like the um, uh, public AKS cluster. That's that's very cool. And so this is and uh, you know to be clear to everyone, this is a CNCF uh, talk. We're not here pitching a product. This is this is the open source, right? This is the guy that correct you know, confirm this. This is this, the open source one that I can go and get right now. Absolutely, uh, all all of all Bridge Crew uh, open source is Apache two license, so you can take it, do whatever you want with it. We'll be happy to to get contribution back and and to let and you know let us know how it works. That's that's very awesome. I like that a lot. Yeah, so I think that's uh, that's my portion, and we can uh, start wrapping up. I think so. I think uh, I think we've, I've I've got a, a final slide just to see us out. But actually, at this point, this is when everybody should be typing lots of questions in there. I see that we've had one come in already, but this is your opportunity while I share out my screen uh, and get away from that last slide. So let's recap this while everyone's thinking of their very difficult questions for you, hopefully. Um, what, what's the benefits to all of this? We've described, we went through a nice bit of us chatting. We've seen some really cool stuff. Thank you, because that is the first time I've seen a lot of that cool stuff. Uh, and now what's the benefits, Guy? Yeah, so maybe let's quickly frame this approach as people are typing uh, typing in their questions. Uh, we've singled out policy as code in, in this quick demo. and. We're we're kind of uh, playing through to to, to that uh, to that end goal. But if you think of policy as code, the nice thing about these standalone utilities, they give you the opportunity to test it yourself, um, download locally, run it against your actual code, um, and if you don't want to, you can take a, something like an extension that gives you some of that insight directly into your into your coding experience. Why is this uh, amazingly awesome for people that are doing cloud native development? Um, it's powered by a community, just like all of the other tools that we love using, like Kubernetes, Terraform, and others. And it creates a repeatable process for you. You don't need to run that CLI over and over again. You put it once into your uh, into your CI process. You deploy this extension once into your VS Code, 
and you're suddenly protected and your code gets so much better than it was before. Um, second biggest benefit I see is the fact that you are uh, you conscious about the fact that there's going to be issues that you're not going to be able to fix, uh, but it's going to get you much, much faster to fix the ones that do have a fix. And um, and we, we can spend, you know, eternity um, creating um, bills of, uh, of of open source materials that we can't rip out. We can create um, um, spreadsheets on spre on top of spreadsheets of all of the vulnerable packages that we might have buried inside our package JSON in a repo, and we can't replace because it's running our code. But if we start by focusing on the configurations that we can literally change by adding one or two lines of code, um, that will just bring you so much faster into into much more secure and robust by default infrastructure, uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, third benefit is that when we introduce some of these tooling into areas like our IDE, our pull request process, we're making sure that they don't arrive into runtime. If it's in runtime, that means friction. That means an application needs to be changed, to be altered, needs to be shut down in order for us to make it slightly more secure. That's some, something that most business don't have a lot of tolerance to. So as, as we pull those insights much deeper into our development lifecycle, that's what is essentially going to bring us into a more robust and, and secure by default infrastructure, cloud infrastructure. So, and to me, that's the that's the big one. And uh, everyone who's listening can can breathe a sigh of relief. You don't need to listen to this crazy yeah. Scotsman anymore. But that's the big one for me is that, that the friction. Uh, there, there's one thing trying to present something to go into production and not knowing that you've got these holes or that they're going to be picked up or someone's going to shout about them. But actually, it eases it a lot more if you go, yes, well, I've, I'm aware fully of all the issues, and this is the only one that's a security one, and here's why that's necessary, or here's the risk associated with it. So no, I, I find that uh, that was really good. Guy, thank you very, very much. I really do. I, I love talking to you. It's, it's really good. Um, thank you for letting me bully you at the start. And I've not seen that demo, so I really enjoyed seeing that demo. Thank you. I do see that we've got a question in there. Lots of people saying hello, which is nice. Hello, everybody. There is another question. Um, I'm going to read it out because then you need to answer it, Guy. If I find issues using Chekhov and I don't own the template, what's the best way to get the other person to make the fix? Yeah, um, definitely, definitely a good question that's going to be on your mind if you're going to try to implement Chekhov. So the world kind of splits into two problem spaces. One is going to be the infrastructure that you have composed and owned, and the other is going to be the public modules and artifacts that you've uh, downloaded from a hopefully a secure location from the public internet. Um, the first cluster, uh, first group is, is very, very easy, right? So this is infrastructure that I compose, I own, I can fix them directly, I don't need, need to ask anyone, uh, should, should be pretty straightforward. Um, nice thing about Chekhov is that it's fully aware of encapsulated modules and variables that are used locally. So if you fix, uh, if it identifies a problem, you'll be able to identify it all the way into uh, the variable that um, that it originated from. That second cluster is a problem, um, and that's where um, platform and infra infrastructure teams use Chekhov on a day-to-day -day basis to identify the um, templates, the modules that are getting uh, used by by teams that are not vetted uh, beforehand, and that's uh, that's the group where uh, we we need we need better visibility on as as an industry and and. And, um, and and one of the one of the ways to make that vetting and to make those changes is to contribute back. If you if you're using a publicly accessible module from something like the Terraform registry or from Artifact Hub, um, you know, step up and help us uh, uh, configure uh, secure defaults to those and help us kind of bump up those. Uh, uh, I think it was 43, 47 percent for most of them, um, and make make sure more more and more public configurations are in par with uh, what we want our private configurations to be to be adhering to well and in, in which case I'll, I'll add on to that from from the work that i've done along with people in cncf and work with cncf it's, it's the same kind of thing don't feel put off if you want to contribute back that you you need to just do code it doesn't have to be just code the cncf is the reason why it's so successful is because of this community and so this community is about you can contribute back in, in many different ways. You can contribute back with time, documentation, holding meetups, being involved, coming along to things like this. So, yes, absolutely everything that Guy said. But also, if, if, you, if you're doing something and you see something, just, just get involved and, and, and be part of it. Uh, that, that was really exciting. Thank you very much. I'm actually looking, 
looking at time, um, I don't see any other questions coming through on chat. So I am going to put you on the spot. Guy, what's your favorite part in the whole of the checkoff? And maybe Bridge Crew, but you're not supposed to go into any product stuff, so don't go into product stuff. But anything for checkoff, what's your favorite thing when you've been using it? What got you about the whole thing? The easy one, I think the most inspiring thing has been to see um, teams and people from teams that we looked up, looked upon um, uh, three years ago when we wanted to learn how uh, some of the strongest and, and mo mo most talented teams in cloud native are, are building and, and innovating through the community, seeing them contribute back to Chekhov. So you can, we've recently added a, a page to recognize some of those rock stars that are bringing in some of that world-class uh, knowledge and talent into Chekhov. And, and I think that's been uh, especially especially rewarding to see, uh, to be able to learn through the experiences of you know, people who are operating some of the most complex systems in the world through the lens of, of their uh, code. Yeah, I get that. That's a, that's really good. And uh, thanks for letting me put you on the spot and, and answering uh, that really well. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, listen, everybody, um, I know that sometimes in, in forums like this, it can be difficult to ask questions because, it, it, it you know, that's the way of the world. It's, it's It can be obtrusive. Even when we were in person, it was always difficult in a, in a forum like this to get people to ask questions. Oftentimes, it was afterwards people would come up and say, hey, I just wanted to know about such and such. So, listen, you can reach out to us. Obviously, Palo Alto Networks, we are obviously uh, happy to hear from you. Um, I'm award at paloaltonetworks.com. Guys, guy isn't called a guy at, at paloaltonetworks.com, so that's the G instead of the instead of the guy. But get in touch. Please reach out. Anything we can do to help, with that, that's why we do this, right? So, Guy, I'll finish off. Thank you for your time. You did the bulk of the talking and made me look good, so thank you very much. Thank you both so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if there are no other questions, we will go ahead and wrap this up. And like I said, the decks and the recording will be online later today. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you both so, so much and have a great day. Thanks everybody.